listeners. It is I, D.B. Spitzer, in Farmer Dave, here once again to talk to you about the Cthulhu mythos. Its books, its monsters, its unfortunate human casualties, its timeline in general, and even its tangential bits. Like the dreamlands, or things of a weird nature that are Lovecraftian leaning. Once more we head into those dark woods, further feeling those malevolent forces upon us. Once again we walk down the lightless stone staircase in the middle of nowhere. You- hey everyone. It's me, TV. Just reminding you. We have t-shirts in the shop. Just go to pgttcm.com. Check out all of our cool t-shirts and stickers. Heck, we even got some shelf curtains in there. Keep clean, look cool, have cool stickers to put on stuff. Astounding Stories 6, June 1930. Murder Madness by Murray Leinster. Chapter 6. Murder Madness, part two of a four-part novel by Murray Leinster. Bell of the Secret Trade strikes into the South American jungle to find the hidden stronghold of the Master, the unknown monster whose diabolical poison swiftly and surely is enslaving the whole continent. 7. United States Secret Servicemen have disappeared in South America. Another is found, a screaming homicidal maniac. It is rumored that they are victims of a diabolical poison which produces murder madness. Charlie Bell of the Trade, a secret service organization that does not officially exist, discovers that a sinister system of slavery is flourishing in South America, headed by a mysterious man known only as the Master. This slavery is accomplished by means of a poison which causes its victims to experience a horrible writhing of the hands, followed by a madness to do murder two weeks after the poison is taken. The victims get relief only with an antidote supplied through Ribiera, the master's chief deputy, but in the antidote there is more of the poison which again in two weeks will take effect. So it is that a person who once receives the poison is forever enslaved. Bell learns that Ribiera has kidnapped Paula Canalejas, daughter of a Brazilian cabinet minister, himself a victim who has killed himself on feeling the murder madness caused by the poison coming over him. Bell corners Ribiera in his home, buries the muzzles of two six-guns in his stomach, and demands that he set Paula free. Chapter 6 In this room, the electric lights were necessary at all times. It had occurred to Bell irrelevantly that perhaps there were no windows because there might be sometimes rather noisy scenes within these walls, and windows will convey the sound of screaming to the outside air, while solid walls will not. He stood alert and grim, with his revolvers pressing into Ribiera's flabby flesh. His fingers were tensed upon the triggers. If he killed Ribiera, he would be killed, of course and men and women he had known and liked might be doomed to the most horrible of fates by Ribiera's death. Yet even the death or madness of many men was preferable to the success of the conspiracy in which Ribiera seemed to figure largely. Ribiera looked up at him with the eyes of a terrified snake. There was a little stirring at the door. Your friends, said Bell softly, had better not come close. Ribiera gasped in order. The stirrings stopped. Paula came slowly into the room quite alone. She smiled queerly at Bell. I believed that you would come, she said quietly. And yet I do not know that we can escape. We're going to try, said Bell grimly. To Ribiera he added curtly. You'd better order the path cleared to the door and have one of your cars brought around. Ribiera croaked a repetition of the command. Now, stand up slowly, said Bell evenly, very slowly. I don't want to die, Ribiera, so I don't want to kill you. But I haven't much hope of escape, so I shan't hesitate very long about doing it. And I've got these guns' hammers trembling at full cock. If I get a bullet through my head... 
They'll go off just the same and kill you. Ribeiro got up slowly. His face was a pasty gray. Your major domo, Bell told him matter-of-factly, will go before us and open every door on both sides of the way to the street. Paula, he used her given name without thought or without realizing it, Paula will go look into each door. If she as much as looks frightened, I fire and try to fight the rest of the way clear. Understand? I'm going to get down to a boat I have ready in the harbor if I have to kill you and every living soul in the house. There was no boat in the harbor, naturally, but the majordomo moved hesitantly across the room, looking at his master for orders. For Ribeiro to die meant death or madness to his slaves. The majordomo's face was ghastly with fear. He moved onward, and Bell heard the sound of doors being thrust wide. Once he gave a command in the staccato fashion of a terrified man. Bell nodded grimly. Now we'll move. Slowly, Ribeiro. Always slowly. Ah, uh -huh, that's better. Paula, you go on before and look into each room. I shall be sorry if any of your servants follow after you. Ribeiro. Though through the doorway, yes, all clear, Paula. I'm balancing the hammers very carefully, Ribeiro. Very delicate work. It is fortunate for you that my nerves are rather steady. But really, I don't much care. Still all clear before us, Paula? With the servants nerve-wracked as they are, I believe we'll make it through even if I do kill Ribeiro. There'll be no particular point in killing us then. It won't help them. Don't stumble, please, Ribeiro. Go carefully and very slowly. Ribeiro's face was a gray mask of terror when they reached the door. A long, low car with two men on the chauffeur's seat was waiting. Only one man up front, Ribeiro, said Bell dryly. No ostentation, please. Now, I hope your servants haven't summoned the police, because they might want to stop me from marching you out there with a gun in the small of your back. And that would be deplorable, Ribeiro. Quite deplorable. With a glance, he ordered Paula into the tonneau. He followed her, driving Ribeiro before him. There seemed to be none about but the stricken, terrified servant who had opened the door for their exit. My friend, Bell told the Major Domo grimly, I'll give you a bit of comfort. I'm not going to try to take the Senor Ribeiro away with me. Once I'm on board the yacht that waits for me, I'll release him so he can keep you poor devils sane until my government has found a way to beat this devilish poison of his. Then I'll come back and kill him. Now you can tell the chauffeur to drive us to the Biera Mar. He settled back in his seat. There were beads of perspiration on his forehead, but he could not wipe them off. He held the two revolvers against Ribeiro's flabby body. The car turned the corner, and he added dryly, Your servants, Ribeiro, will warn your prominent slaves of my intention of going on board a yacht. Preparations will be made to stop every pleasure boat and search it for me. So, tell your chauffeur to swing about and make for the flying field, and tell him to drive carefully, by the way. I've still got these guns on a very fine adjustment of the trigger pressure. Ribeiro croaked the order. Bell was exactly savage enough to kill him if he did not escape. For twenty minutes the car sped through the residential districts of Rio. The sun was high in the air, but clouds were banking up above the Pau d'Azucar, the sugar loaf. And it looked as though there might be one of the sudden summer thunderstorms that sometimes sweep Rio. Then the clear road to the flying field. Rio has the largest metropolitan d district in the world, but a great deal of it is piled on end, and Rio itself built on most of the rest. The flying field is necessarily some miles from even the residential districts, for the sake of a level plain of sufficient area. The car shot ahead through practically untouched jungle, interspersed with tiny clearings in which were patchwork houses that might have been a thousand miles in the interior instead of so near the center of all civilization in Brazil. Up smooth gradients, around beautifully engineered curves. Bell put aside one revolver long enough to search Ribeira carefully. He found a pearl-handled automatic and handed it to Paula. Worth having, he said cheerfully. I wonder if you'd mind searching the chauffeur with that gun at his head. I think he'd be peaceful. You needn't have him stop. Paula stood up, smiling a little. I did not think I lacked courage, senor, but you have taught me more. Nil desperandum, said Bell lightly. He relaxed deliberately. 
Matters would be tense at the flying field, and, and he would need to be wholly calm. There was little danger of an attempt at rescue here, and the necessity of being ready to shoot Ribiera at any instant was no longer a matter of split seconds. He watched while, bent over the back of the front seat, she extracted two squat weapons from the chauffeur's pockets. "'Quite an arsenal,' said Bell, as he pocketed them. He turned pleasantly to Ribiera. "'Now, Ribiera, you understand just what I want. That big amphibian plane of yours is fairly fast, and once, when I was merely your guest, you assured me that it was always kept fueled and even provisioned for a long flight. When we reach the flying field, I want it rolled out and warmed up, over at the other end of the field from the flying line. We'll go over to it in the car. And I've thought of something. It worried me before, because sometimes, if a man's shot, he merely relaxes all over. So while we're at the flying field, I'm going to be holding back the triggers of these guns with my thumbs. I don't have to pull the trigger at all. Just let go and they'll go off. It isn't so fine an adjustment as I had just now, but it's safer for you as long as you behave. And you might urge your chauffeur to be cautious. I do hope, Riviera, that you won't look as if you were frightened. If there's any hitch and delay for letting some fuel out of the tanks or messing up the motors, I'll be very sorry for you. The car swooped out into the bright sunshine. The flying field lay below, already in the shadow of the banking clouds above. Hangers lay stretched out across the level space. Through the gates, Ribiera licked his lips. Bell jammed the revolver muzzles closer against his sides. The chauffeur halted the car. Paula spoke softly to him. He stiffened. Bell found it possible to smile faintly. Ribiera gave orders. There was a moment's pause. The revolver muzzles went deeper into his side, and he snarled a repetition. The official cringed and moved slightly. "'You have chosen your slaves well, Riviera,' said Bell coolly. "'They seem to occupy all strategic positions. We'll ride across.' The gears clashed. The car swerved forward and went deliberately across the wide, clear space that was the flying field. It halted near the farther side. In minutes, the door of a hangar swung wide. There was the sputtering of a not-yet-warmed-up motor. The big plane came slowly out, its motors coughing now and then. It swung clumsily across the field, turned in a wide circle, and stopped some forty or fifty feet from the car. "'Send the mechanic back on foot,' said Bell softly. Again, Riviera found it expedient to snarl. And Bell added gently while the throttled-down motors of the big amphibian boomed on. Now we get out of the car. Tiny figures began to gaze curiously at them from the row of hangars. The mechanic starting back on foot, the four people getting out of the car, the big plane waiting. With his revolver ready and aimed at Riviera's bulk, Bell reached in the front of the car and turned off the switch. The motor died abruptly. He put the key in his pocket. Just to get a minute or two extra start, he said dryly. Climb up in the plane, Paula. She obeyed and turned at the top. I will cover them until you are up, she said quietly. Bell laughed now, a genuine laugh for the first time in many days. We do work together, he said cheerfully. But he backed up the ladder. There was a stirring over by the hangars. The mechanic who had taxied the plane to this spot was a dwindling speck no more than a third of the way across the field. But even from the distant hangars, it could be seen that something was wrong. Close the door, Paula, said Bell. He had seated himself at the controls and scanned the instruments closely. The machine was heavy and large and massive. The boat body between the retractable wheels added weight to the structure, and when Bell gave it the gun, it seemed to give up speed with an irritating slowness and to roll and lurch very heavily when it did begin to approach flying speed. The run was long before the tail came up. It was longer before the joltings lessened and the plane began to rise slowly, with the solid steadiness that only a large and heavily loaded plane can compass. Up and up. Bell was three hundred feet high when he crossed the hangars and saw tiny faces staring up at him. Some of the small figures were pointing across the field. 
The big plane circled widely, gaining altitude, and Bell gazed down. Ribiera was gesticulating wildly, pointing upward to the soaring thing, shaking his fist at it, and making imperious, frantic motions of command. Bell took one quick glance all about the horizon. Toward the sea, the sun shone down brilliantly upon the city. Inland, a broad white wall of advancing rain moved toward the coastline, and Bell smiled frostily and flung the big ship into a dive and swooped down upon Riviera as a hawk might swoop at a chicken. Riviera saw the monster thing bearing down savagely, its motors bellowing, its nose pointed directly at him, and there is absolutely nothing more terrifying upon the earth than to see a plane diving upon you with deadly intent. A panic that throws back to non-human ancestors seizes upon a man. He feels the paralysis of those ancient anthropoids who were preyed upon by dying races of winged monsters in the past. That racial atavistic terror seizes upon him. Bell laughed, though it sounded more like a bark as Ribiera flung himself to the ground and screamed hoarsely when the plane seemed about to pounce upon him. The shrill timbre of the shriek cut through the roaring of the motors even through the thick padding of the big plane's cabin walls that reduced that roaring to a not intolerable growl. But the plane passed ten feet or more above its head. It rose and climbed steeply and passed again above the now buzzing agitated hangars, and climbed above the hills behind the flying field as some men went running and others moved by swifter means toward the shaken nerve-wracked Riviera, on whose lips were flecks of foam. Bell looked far below and far behind him. The incredible greenness of tropic verdure, of the jungle which rings Rio all about. The many glitterings of sunlight upon glass, and upon the polished domes of sundry public buildings, and the multitudinous shimmerings of the tropic sun upon the bay. The deep dark shadow of the banking clouds drew a sharp line across the earth, and deep in that shadow lay the flying field, growing small and distant as the plane flew on. But specks raced across the wide expanse. In the peculiar, irrational fashion, those specks darted toward a nearly invisible speck, and encountered other specks darting away from that nearly invisible speck, and gradually all the specks were turned about and racing for the angular toy-block squares which were hangars of the aeroplanes of the city of Rio de Janeiro. Little white things appeared from those hangars, planes being thrust out into the open air while while motes of men raced agitatedly about them. One of them was suddenly in motion. It moved slowly and clumsily across the ground, and then abruptly moved more swiftly. It seemed to float upward and to swing about in mid-air. It came floating toward the amphibian, although apparently nearly stationary against the sky. Another moved jerkily, and another. Just before the big plane dived into the wide, white wall of falling water, the air behind it seemed to swarm with aircraft. In the cabin of the amphibian, of course, the bellowing of the motors outside was muffled to a certain degree. Paula clung to the seats and moved awkwardly up to the place beside Bell. She had just managed to seat herself when the falling sheet of water obliterated all the world. "'Strap yourself in your seat,' he said in her ear above the persistent tumult without. "'Then you might adjust my safety belt. We'll be flying blind in this rain.' I hope the propellers hold. She fumbled, first at the belt beside his upholstered chair, and only afterward adjusted her own. He sent a quick glance at her. Shouldn't have done that, he said quietly. I can manage somehow. The plane lurched and tumbled wildly. He kicked rudder and jerked on the stick, watching the instrument board closely. In moments the wild gyrations ceased. The beginning of this, he said evenly, is going to be hectic. There'll be lightning soon. Almost on his words, the gray mist out of the cabin windows seemed to flame. There was thunder, even above the motors, but the faint, perceptible trembling of the whole plane under the impulse of its engines kept on. Bell kept his eyes on the bank and turn indicator, glancing now and then at the altimeter. We've got to climb, he said shortly. Up where the lightning is, too. We want to pass the Serra da Carioca, with room to spare, or we'll crash on it. There was no noticeable change in the progress of the plane, of course. Rain was dashing against the windows of the cabin with an incredible velocity. 
Rain at a hundred miles an hour acts more like hail than water, anyhow, and Bell was trusting grimly to the hope that the propellers were of steel, which will withstand even hail, and a hope that the blast through the engine cowlings would keep the wiring free of water-made short circuits. But the air was bad beyond belief. At times the plane spun like thistledown in a vast and venomous flood that crashed into the windows with a vicious rattling. Lightning began and grew fiercer. It seemed at times as if the plane were whirling crazily in sheer incandescent flame. The swift air currents at the beginning of a tropic thunderstorm were here multiplied in trickiness and velocity by the hills of the Serra da Carioca, and Bell was flying blind as well. The safety belts were needed fifty times within twenty minutes, as the big ship was flung about by fierce blasts that sometimes blew even the rain upward for a time. And over all, as the amphibian spun madly, and toppled crazily and fought for height, there was the terrific, incessant crashing of thunder, which was horribly close, and the crackling flares of lightning all about. "'I'm going to take a chance,' said Bell curtly above the roar, with the windows seeming to look out upon the fires of hell. "'I think we're high enough. The compass has gone crazy, but I'm going to risk it.' Again, there was no perceptible alteration in the motion of the ship, but he fought it steadily toward the west, and it seemed that he actually was passing beyond the fierce first fringe of the storm, because the lightning became, well, not less frequent, but less continuous. And suddenly, in a blinding flare of light that made every separate raindrop look like a speck of molten lava, he saw another airplane. It was close, breathtakingly close. It came diving down out of nowhere and passed less than twenty yards before the nose of the amphibian. It glistened with wet and glittered unbearably in the incredible brightness of the lightning. Every spot and speck and detail showed with an almost ghastly distinctness. But it dived on past, its pilot rigid and tense and unseeing, plunging like a meteor straight downward. The golden iridescent mist of rain closed over its body, and it was gone. Ten minutes later, Bell was driving onward through a gray obscurity, which now was no more than tinted pink by receding lightning flashes. The air was still uneven and treacherous. The big plane hurtled downward hundreds of feet in wild, descending gusts among the hills, and was then flung upward on invisible billows of air for other hundreds of feet. But it was less uncontrollable. There were periods of minutes when the safety belts did not come into use. And later still half an hour, perhaps, the steadiness of the air gave assurance that the plane was past the range of the Serra da Carioca and was headed inland. He drove on, watching his instruments and flying blind, but with a gathering confidence in an ultimate escape from the swarm of aircraft Riviera had sent aloft in the teeth of the storm to hunt for him. The motors hummed outside the padded cabin. The girl beside him was very quiet and very still and very pale. We want to get out of this before long, he said in her ear, and then we can find out where we are and especially begin to make some plans for ourselves. Her eyes turned to him. There was a curious stiffness in her manner. It might have seemed reserved, but Bell recognized the symptoms of a woman whose self-control is hanging by a thread. He smiled. Hold on a while yet, he said gently. I know you want to cry, but please hold on a while yet. When we reach friends... Her hands went to her throat, and he could feel the effort of will that kept her voice steady. Friends? We have no friends, she managed with a smile. The Senor Ribiera explained to me when I arrived at his house how it was that no questions would be asked about my disappearance. My father is dead. The newspapers this morning said it was not known whether he killed himself or was assassinated. The Senor Ribiera has given orders to his slaves. The newspapers of this afternoon will inform a horrified world that you and I together murdered my father that we might flee together, with such as his riches as he actually gathered together for me to take away. We are murderers, my friend. Cables and telegraph wires are reporting the news. 
the daughter of the minister of war of the republic of brazil was assisted by her lover to murder her father she has fled with him now where are we still to find friends bell stared for the fraction of an instant one thought came to him and was checked the trade does not exist anywhere the trade would not help and murderers were always duly handed over when the government of the United States is requested politely to do so by another nation. Always. And so far as the whole civilized world was concerned, they were murderers. Even the employees of the flying field, who were not subject to the master, would swear to the strictly accurate story of their escape together. It is just scandalous enough, and horrible enough, said Bell quietly, to be reprinted everywhere as news. You're right. We haven't any friends. We're up against it. And so I think we'll have to hunt down and kill the master. Then we'll be believed. And there are just two of us, with what weapons we have in our pockets, to attack. How many thousands of slaves do you suppose the master has by now? And quite suddenly, he laughed. End of Murder Madness, Chapter 6, by Murray Leinster. To the Cthulhu Mythos, you can help show your support by going to the show notes and following any of the links that'll tell you how to support the show, now to support our guests, and thank you to all of our guests who you can find in the show notes. Rate, review, subscribe, and remember, patrons get priority access to asking us questions, suggesting topics, even... I don't know, uh, submitting stuff. Actually, you don't have to be a patron to submit anything. That's how Dave got on the show, and that's how you can get on the show, too. It's the people's guide to the Cthulhu mythos. Rate, review, subscribe, tell your friends. Thank you for listening. Back to the show.